if you don't understand the lie and the purpose, the reason why they are constructing this lie, you are going to be led directly into the wrong, fake, phony solution that they're pushing you, they're pushing society into. That's the point of this. And people who want a convenient lie, uh, that, that really annoys me. You're listening to The Corbett Report. So, James, I just, per, per the conversation, because I know we're limited on time, and we could go, like, several hours with this. What's up, Pat? I want to do you somewhat follow. I just don't want to jump right into the climate change, because, like, per your videos, it really started with these old fuckers and the whole eugenic stuff, and then they had to change the nomenclature, and then that moved, obviously, into more East Strong, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that background its foundation is crucial to how they, you know, changed that language, and then now doing this whole completely carbon, post-carbon, and hundreds of trillions of dollars and now it's really changing the game so just to throw that out there yeah is that where you want do you guys want to start with that or well yeah i mean i mean obviously the conversation is climate change but i like i said i think that kind of foundation that was laid before they changed the name and all that was eugenics and these guys you know uh rockefeller the third etc etc you know moving into these different umbrella organizations whether it's the ipcc un etc etc but this all was under the auspices of basically eugenics, and then they changed the language for the purpose of sustainable development and controlling resources and telling us to only have one and a half kid or whatever it is. Yeah, we could expand on that because I think people who might be familiar with eugenics and might be familiar with climate change might not know where where's the relation. Where they well, that's what James going to kind of bridge that gap. But I'm just saying since we don't have as much time as probably we would like, I'm just I just want to make sure we hit those those particular follow it kind of chrono- chronologically. How much time would you like? We only got like f- about 50 minutes, 45 minutes with James. He's got a hard out. Oh, okay. Okay. So, so I like that. I like uh, how you blurred out the background. I've done that with my, <laughs> it actually looks pretty cool. That's what I was just telling them about you because if they want to hit you, they got, you know, I'm going to be in Sioux Falls, 426, Vail, Colorado, 5 <laughs> 3. <laughs> All right. Ready to go. <clears throat> So James, do you want do you want to talk? I, you knowing so much, James, is almost a gift and a curse because we always go to you for guidance. It's always like, hey James, want to expand on this because we're going to do a shitty job doing it, and you're going to do the best, uh, you know, give it the the best. Uh, I guess you know, get we fill in the gaps. We fill in the gaps. Yeah, it is a curse because I've got this much information and trying to <laughs> squeeze it out of this mouth hole in a yeah. logical uh, way is extremely difficult. So. The first thing I'll do is just recommend people, if you haven't yet, please go to CorbettReport.com slash Big Oil. That is my How and Why Big Oil Conquered the World documentaries, which is the big, big, big overview picture. It's one of the most important things I've ever done, so if you haven't watched it yet, or listened to it yet, or read it yet, shame on you. It's 100% for free, and it represents essentially a decade of research, um, trying to distill it into a narrative that I hope makes sense. But yes, this narrative takes us... Essentially, from the 19th century and the development of the oil industry into the current day and age of climate change hysteria, into the future of technocracy. And these are all related items, and there's some very extremely important historical linkages that we can paint between this. And uh, so one of them is the concept of eugenics, which for people who don't know, late 19th century, basically the British gentleman scientists of the time decided that you know what, I think we are the natural rulers of the world because our genetics make us that way. And genetics was, well, gene had not quite been uh, discovered by that point, but the uh, the principle of hereditary uh, traits being passed on was starting to be developed by Mendel and others looking at pea pods. And they said, well, pea pods, humans, it's the same thing. (laughs) And, And yeah, genetic traits, well, that must include the fact that poor people tend to have poor children. Why? Because they have bad genes, of course. And rich people have rich children because we have the superior genes and we're designed to rule over you. So this was a mindset that was uh, that took off in the late 19th century, developed in the early 20th century. It started in England. It moved over to America in the early 20th century. Um, uh, Charles Davenport and people like this were propounding it and it became exceptionally popular. It was the rock star super science of the early 20th century in a way that we can't fathom unless we put it into the current 21st century context. Basically, it was the climate change science of 
the early 20th century, everyone who was anyone and had to at least mouth the words, oh, eugenics, oh, we must be concerned about these poor people breeding too much, and how do we get the, the best people to breed together, the rich? Um, that was the concern of everyone who was anyone at that time. And that uh, was, as I show in the Big Oil documentary, it, it was fostered and inculcated and propounded by the oligarchs who had consolidated so much power in the 19th century because, hey, they were at the top of the heap at this point, so, hey, yeah, it's because we have great genes or whatever. It was their self-justification in a scientific age for what in a previous age would have been the divine right of kings or whatever. God made us exactly. into rulers of the yep. world. Um, now it's the Kardashians and the Jenners. Yeah, well, those are the uh, that that's the puppets that are thrown out on the stage for people to gawk over and oh look they're rich and famous and that's what we have to aspire right. to. And, Whereas and the people with real was, power and control are literally that's making the money, literally printing the money into existence. So money in a, in and of itself is almost meaningless in a system like that. Um, it's just points on the scoreboard, as it were. Um, but uh, so we have to understand those roots because. Throughout the early part of the 20th century, as I say, it developed and everyone who was anyone was writing about it and talking about it and thinking about it. There was entire scientific societies dedicated to the study of eugenics and how do we, how do we limit the, the poor population and, and how do we foster the rich population? And Going as far as creating these steril terms. sterilization laws in the 19, early 1900s. Sterilization this was laws, a huge the, part the of the story case. in the United States, in a number of countries, uh, even here in Japan. I think I remember reading recently the last sterilization took place in the 1990s. Was it here or in Alberta? Anyway. They're sterilizing people. No, they're sterilizing people in Africa now with the... Uh, they certainly are, but I mean the on the books, on the records, we are going to sterilize you kind of things, not this the programs that they are still running on the entire human population, given, I mean, the fact that sperm counts have dropped 50% in the past half century. Yeah, you think there's some sort of sterilization program going on? I think so. Anyway, but the On the Records books uh, on, uh, of sterilization programs that was passed in many states in the United States, um, for my American friends out there, um, was an exceptionally important part of that program. But that eugenics movement that started in Britain, was fostered in America, uh, got taken up in Germany, and got mixed up with some other kind of Aryan pure race ideas, and you know, the, those Nazis kind of made it look like a bad thing. Oh, damn them. They made, they made eugenics sound like a bad thing, and everyone equates now eugenics with Nazis. So we have to drop that word. And the eugenicists were explicitly aware of this. They wrote about it openly, talked about it in their journals and in their conferences at the time. Eugenics is a dirty word. We have to change the name. I mean, we're not going to change the idea. The idea is, is still exactly the same. We need to sterilize and limit the poor population. We need to foster the rich population. But we can't say that openly anymore. So, Which what by are we 1945, do? 19, by 1945, uh, 400,000 Germans were sterilized. So they were well on their way. Well, and the ones that the ones that are able to reproduce, you just Planned Parenthood the hell out of them, right? Exactly right. And Planned Parenthood with Margaret Sanger, who was a eugenicist, talked openly about it, uh, well documented, but now we hand people awards, the Sanger Award for being, you know, a brave woman or whatever it is to people like Hillary Clinton. Yay. So it's all it's all this rich tapestry that most people that has been deliberately precluded from our education. No one learns about eugenics anymore. I was, I remember a decade ago talking to a person here in Japan who I'd met who had studied, I think to the master's level in genetics. And I was, so I, I broached the topic of eugenics and he's, he literally had not even heard the word eugenics before. That's, How's that now, possible? And that's he's incredible. A that's horrific. But this is the master's level wait, wait, wait. education. He's a genetic. He's a geneticist and hadn't heard of eugenics. He literally wow. asked me, "What's eugenics?" Wow. Well, <laughs> so, I, I would recommend this is this is the state of education at this point. Um, uh, one doc, a, a great documentary on this topic, and I was actually, I think this was years ago. James brought it up either on my show or some other discussion. Uh, Mafa Twenty One, or I don't know how you pronounce it, but. Uh, M A A F A twenty one. Yeah. yeah, and it's in my uh, it, it, on my YouTube channel on my in my documentary playlist. It's an amazing documentary. I put all these doc. It's amazing how many of these documentaries get pulled. I, I have this playlist on on YouTube where I have a bunch of free documentaries on YouTube, and I'm always adding stuff. 
And people are always hitting me up. They're like, hey, a bunch of stuff's missing. A bunch of stuff's missing. And it's like every time I go in there, it says deleted, 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 you know, video. And uh, and that's one of them that keeps uh, disappearing. And and I imagine that. finding other sources. But it's a, it's a great, I mean, it really goes into how eugenics really was just a bullshit science that was used to justify racism, basically, you know, and, or classism. Racism, you know, classism, classism, any classism, any yeah. ism that propounds the status quo and the rich who were already in charge of the system. Um, but the point of this, in terms of the climate change debate, is that, as I say, in the 50s, they were openly talking about how do we make eugenics into crypto eugenics, eugenics by another name. And the first... Uh, idea that they hit on was population control. That was the moniker that they 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 embraced. And so you get uh, J.D. Rockefeller III and the Population Council. Literally, I mean, again, the oligarch families literally fun- founding and funding these organizations into existence. Um, and the Population Council was, of course, concerned about overpopulation in these uh, third world countries. Too many poor people. We need to improve life, of course. And, if, and this always takes the form of, as you mentioned, uh, steriliz- covert sterilization programs in Africa and India and other places. Sometimes quite overt. But anyway, this is the, the form Pruitt, that it I takes. go St. Louis? Sorry. Pruitt, I go St. Louis. It's a community here in St. Louis that had biological and chemical testing on it as well as sterilization. Yeah. Like Tuskegee well, and many 60s? other such uh, ignomies of American medical history. Um, but the point is, from that point, it started to merge with the environmental movement, which was really getting going at that time. You have, uh, was it Rachel Carson, The Silent Spring, and, and things like this. We're fostering an awareness of ecosystem, and we're part of a planet, and you know it's a life support system for the planet, and we have to balance it. The crypto-eugenicists latched onto that. Um, un- I mean, for one thing reading the tea leaves, seeing which w- direction the wind is blowing. People are involved and interested in this movement. It has that kind of grassroots feel to it. But you have literally the World Wildlife Fund and these other, the Nature Conservancy, these big groups that uh, were extremely well-funded because they were founded by the literal card-carrying eugenicists of old, literal eugenic society heads and uh, people like... Um, uh, 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 not Julie, uh, not Aldous Huxley, Julian Huxley. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. UNESCO, UNESCO. UNESCO uh, right. literally on uh, helped found WWF, along with, of course, the British royalty and uh, Dutch royalty and others behind Royal Dutch Shell, for example. I mean, again, it's literally the oligarchs, literally the eugenicists becoming the environmental movement and pushing well, yeah, that you into have the... To, you, have to, you have to put sheep's wool over the over the evil plan. Of course. I mean, that was Of course. Very this obvious. is an important point. Just because they took over and, and managed and steered this environmental movement doesn't mean that environmentalism or being concerned about the planet is a bad thing. No, on the contrary, it means that is a natural human tendency. We want to take care of the planet, and they're going to use that urge by di- misdirecting that urge into unproductive ways or uh, counterproductive ways, like the modern environmental movement, which does not talk about genetic modification. It does not talk about EMF and wireless radiation and these types of extremely important environmental concerns. No, it is 100% carbon dioxide. Not even greenhouse gases in general, of which carbon dioxide is a tiny fraction. No, carbon dioxide almost exclusively. And why is that? That is because it is the choke point of the industrial economy. If you want a developed industrial economy, you need carbon to produce carbon dioxide at this point. So if you can demonize that, you demonize the entire economic system as it stands. That is the underlying economic basis for the crypto-eugenic movement that is this hijacked environmental movement. And that's leading us into technocracy, the world of the future, where everything will be cracked down on to the point where all of our energy will be controlled and actually used as a currency. That is where this is going. Energy. But before we jump into technocracy, though, I want to make sure we cover cats like because like you said, under the auspices of these certain organizations, UNESCO, IPCC, et cetera, et cetera, you have all these kind of umbrella organizations. And somebody who was hugely, hugely a part of that was a gentleman by the name of Maurice Strong. If you can break down a little bit who he is and how he was has been huge as far as, as far as facilitating this agenda. If you just read the basic biographical breakdown of Morris Strong, there is no way that you cannot be a little bit overwhelmed. Like, how on earth did this happen? A junior high school dropout, 
He was from a poor family in rural Manitoba that uh, was suffering from the Great Depression when Strong was born. And he went on to uh, organize the Stockholm Environmental Conference, found as the founding director of the United Nations Environment Program. He was the Secretary, Secretary General of the Rio Earth Summit. He was the founder of the Earth Council and the Earth Charter Movement, the chair of the World Resources Institute, commissioner of the World Commission on Environment and Development. I could go on and on. Like You can literally go on for paragraphs just citing his various titles and, and uh, positions. And oh yeah, one other thing. He was a self-made mil self <laughs> millionaire uh, by his uh, or late 20s in the oil patch in Alberta uh, with a lot of help from Rockefeller and Rockefeller Associates at Standard Oil. Oh, huh. Wow, strange. A literal oil man who made his wealth in the oil trade is the person who is one of the leading lights of late 20th century environmental movement. Isn't that strange? Doesn't that ring any bells for anyone or make any sort of alarm noises? It does for me, and it should, because more. the more you look into Morris Strong, the crazier the story is. Not even talking about his aunt, Anna Louise Strong, who was this communist who consorted with uh, Lenin and, uh, and Mao. She ended up in China, where Morris Strong ended up at the end of his life as he was disgraced in the oil for food scandal and with Iraq and all of that. That's that's all another crazy sidebar to this story, although obviously some important points in there to be made. But Morris Strong and his shepherding of this environmental movement into this international organization or organizations, interlocking organizations, to be presided over by the loving arms of the United Nations <laughs> under this Earth Charter, which is the, uh, has often been compared, I believe it was either by himself or by Mikhail Gorbachev, who was one of the other um, pen or writers of the Earth Charter, uh, compared it to the uh, the Ten Commandments. This is the Ten Commandments for the you know, for the modern age, uh, about all about how the earth, you know, we have to worship the earth and blah, blah, blah. It's, it's craziness. Worship. It's, it's well, something craziness. to think about the, the weird contradiction. Like you said, Maurice Strong being the head of uh, Petro Canada while spearheading, you know, basically all of this, this climate change conversation. It, it really is interesting because something not to overlook. And I kind of wanted to start out with this, how you have so many of these oil guards, these oil tycoons who have divested trillions and trillions of dollars of the, from the oil and put that into this new technology, sustainable development and technocracy, et cetera. Talk about that if you don't mind. I mean, I don't mean to throw in too much in the in the middle of things, but how these families are already ahead of the game and divesting so much and already invested huge in this new this new evolution. It's an extremely important point because the the oligarchs, as I call them, uh, have known for for some time now that they are hated that the public understands the game, that the game is for control over energy, and that uh, the oligarchs won it in the late 19th century and have been using that power and money uh, for political influence for the past century uh, in various ways. And the public has identified that and understands it. Big oil is a bad thing. That is not a controversial statement with most people these days. But having understood that, well, what is the way to get around that? It is, of course, to lead the anti-big oil movement. <laughs> you get in front of the wave and lead it and, again, push it in the direction that you want. So now, uh, as you say, big news. Uh, 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 several years ago, the Rockefellers are now completely divested from oil. And look, they've, they've, they've unloaded billions and billions of dollars and all their shares and things. Well, they might have some some shares here and there, but uh, they're, they're mostly diver divested from oil. Uh, uh, so look, this is good. We're winning, right? The people are right. winning. Big oil is going down. But wait, what's coming along to replace the old big oil monopolies? What what is What is the vision of the future that we're being offered? And the vision of the future is increasingly a completely interconnected 5G-run smart grid Internet of everything, Internet of things, in which every object that is manufactured will have its own IPv6 address and uh, an embedded RFID chip or some other equivalent that will be constantly communicating data about you and your daily activities to the network, through the network, for the purpose of controlling every single interaction and transaction that every single human being on the Earth has. And why is this? It's because... Well, they want to make a better Earth for us, guys. They want to reduce our carbon footprint and make sure that everyone everyone's happy and they can balance it all. It's nonsense when you really break it down, but it is appealing nonsense because it is being cloaked in this green garb. You care about the planet, right? So you've right. got to give them this kind of control. 
Pat, you're muted, buddy. Can't hear you, boss. Patrick J. Can't hear you. When we when we talk about these these oligarchs divesting billions upon billions of dollars and and getting into the green movement and everything else, look, ultimately, it's still the peasants around the world that are funding it through higher taxation and everything else on every gallon of gas that we buy, um, all natural gas that we use, uh, heating fuel, everything else that we touch that has anything to do with fossil fuels, we are paying the price for it. And in the end, you know, when I drive across Western Iowa and I see hundreds of giant windmills that are, you know, they're going to pay for themselves for hundreds of years. They're all going to fall down before they pay for themselves because they're so far away from the grid. They had to pay so much money to friggin' tie them together that we're going to end up being charged even more for what they call green energy when in the end, every person individually should be trying to figure out a way to put solar panels on their roof, a windmill in their yard, dig their own well, and become completely independent from the system and sell energy back to the grid, which in the end, we would probably be charged tax for not using it in the yes. first place because they have to tax us. It's, it's mind-boggling, the layers of control here. And let's add another layer onto this because, of course, one of the reasons, one of the reasons that we are told that gas prices just keep rising and rising and rising forever, seemingly, is because, of course, we're running out of oil, right? And how do we know this? Because of Hubbard's peak. M. King Hubbard came up with the peak oil theory back in the 1950s uh, for Shell, actually. He was working for Shell as a ge- uh, uh, geologist at the time. And he came up with this theory. Well, look, production increases like this, and eventually we're going to tap out, and eventually production will stop. And the funny thing is about Hubbard's Peak and the, the famous curve that everyone's seen is that there's actually no data whatsoever behind it. It is a heuristic tool. He says, well, it must be like this. And he he arbitrarily set the dates, which, by the way, was 2000, right? So... Obviously, there's no more no more increase in oil production since 2000, right? Oh, wait. <laughs> uh, some problems there. But the interesting thing about this is M. King Hubbard, better, best known for Hubbard's peak, peak oil, was in the 1930s a co-founder of Technocracy, Inc., which was the technocracy movement created by uh, Howard Scott, who is a charlatan, a crank, who came up with this idea that was, very, again, very appealing to the elite, is that... Out of Columbia University. Out of, they, they were in the basement of Columbia University for about a year before they got kicked out because it was discovered Howard Scott was a charlatan and didn't have any degree. <laughs> as of, <laughs> So they kicked him out. But he, they, they were in the basement of Columbia, along with IBM, for uh, by the way, which was developing um, some of the latest computer technology in the basement of Columbia, uh, right alongside technocracy at the time. But they were uh, propounding this idea that we can solve all problems, social, political, economic, everything, as long as you have scientists and engineers and economists and professionals in charge. We don't want politicians. We want professionals, technocrats, to run this system. And the technocrats, if you give them enough data, can do anything. So go back and read the Technocracy Study Course, which was the founding document of Technocracy, Inc. It was penned by M. King Hubbard, Hubbard's Peak, M. King Hubbard, And it lists this crazy wish list of things that they basically want to be able to do. 24-7 total surveillance of the economy. Everything that's bought, everything that's sold, everything that's manufactured. How much energy did it take to manufacture it? What was paid for it? Uh, How is it being used? When is it depleted? They wanted total surveillance of everything in the world, which in the 1930s is total crackpot nonsense. What on earth are they thinking? In 2019... Well, that's doable. It's right on time. We can do well, that. See, going back know, to we Pat got the smart grid. About... We got 5G. We got the Internet of Things. We can yes. do this, guys. And so here that's, we go. that's some next level, like what the next evolution is going to go and what back what Pat was saying about how we're going to be paying for this. This is a whole revamping of the whole economic structure, this post-carbon world. Talk to me, if you will, about basically the essence of this, which is what you just said, a resource-based economy versus an energy-based economy and how that's going to just change the whole game. So uh, you can go back, uh, I think 2000, I want to say 2014 or so, Christina Figueres, who at that time was high up in the UN uh, CCCC, uh, uh, the UN Climate Change Committee, essentially, um, uh, bureaucracy. Uh, She was saying that we are proposing nothing less than a fundamental change in the economic development model of the world. It has 
up to this point, or for the last few hundred years, we've been under capitalism. We are going to, for the first time in human history, deliberately and methodically change that development model. Well, what are they changing it into? That's the real question. And as you raise the specter there, it is a resource-based economy. This is the underlying idea of technocracy, in which we don't use currency, you know, pieces of paper printed up by a government out of based on gold reserves or something or based on nothing as is the case these days well, what's the what's the point of that no 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 we need to make engineer an economic model in which currency is literally energy literally your currency will be measured in jewels and you will be allotted a certain number of jewels per per week per month per year whatever it is from the techno the technate which was the name of the political institution that the techno technocrats are going to institute uh, they the engineers and scientists and brilliant people don't worry guys they're specialists and they don't have any any agenda or plan other than your self-interest of course and they're going to decide okay this is how much energy we're produ uh, producing and this is how much energy we need so you're going to get this much energy this is your allotment these are your credits and you can you can spend these in the economy any way you wish guys uh, but and like you said they and they know about that they know how much credits to issue you by the consumption they've been measuring from this your smart meters, et cetera, et cetera. Exactly, and they would never lie about things like that, right? They would no. never, for, for example, purposefully reduce your carbon rations more and more, or your energy rations, so that uh, you basically have a peasant population under the thumb of these techni technocrats and the people who are puppeteering them. Never, never. But uh, This is like straight neo-feudalism. I mean, this is like it a It is new... straight neo-feudalism. Yeah. This is the vision and of well, the future. Well, we're distribution uh, at, the, at a global level. I will, I will lay out the vision of the ultimate end vision of the world and the way it would look under this system, which is to have masses of people packed into these dense urban areas in which, of course, everything is surveilled and controlled 24-7, everything monitored. Uh, carbon credits are allowed for certain uh, daily activities, but they'll, they'll be gradually reduced. So it is essentially a urban peasant population. And meanwhile, vast territories of the Earth, vast swaths of the globe, the natural resources and abundant wealth of the Earth, will be administered by the technate. They will take over these areas in the name of saving the planet and being good to nature and blah, 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 whatever, whatever rhetoric they have to put on top of it. But those will be no-go zones for the regular public. You won't even yeah. have access to vehicles that could get you there because this you'll is be straight, in your I've smart... I've said this before on the show, bro. This is straight... Judge Dredd. I'm a comic book fan. Judge Dredd back in the 80s where everything was mega cities, which you just described. These big urban cities where everybody's got credits and this and that. And anywhere outside it, they call it the cursed earth. Like, oh, my God, nobody goes to the cursed earth because clearly that's being monitored by the people who have our best intention. So let me ask you, man, just as so many of these companies, huge, huge companies, for, got ahead of the curb on, on climate change, et cetera, and divested as a part of this technocracy – how is that with the financial system, blockchain, Bitcoin? When you got the Federal Reserve, you got so many of these huge, huge banks that are already getting their stuff ready for blockchain in a, in a basically a cashless society. Are these? This is essentially kind of a merging of these from cash to social, et cetera, et cetera. This is just like you said, straight technocracy all day. Yeah, yeah but but interestingly, you say blockchain, Bitcoin, Bitcoin, blockchain. As if they're interchangeable. Well, they're, That's they're different. They're separate Digital concepts. currency being run run and monitored on this blockchain. So, but, I, I mean, yeah, you're right. It, it's not mutually exclusive. So I, I detail that point in an episode of my podcast called The Bitcoin PSYOP, where I differentiate between the two and explain why we are being conditioned in our minds to just accept, oh, Bitcoin, blockchain, whatever. Whenever you see blockchain, think Bitcoin. Whenever you see Bitcoin, think blockchain. It's because they want those concepts wedded so that they can introduce all sorts of new ideas, innovative ideas for how they're going to better run the uh, the global financial system based on this amazing new bl blockchain technology. You've heard about it, guys. You know, Bitcoin or whatever. Yeah, you've heard about it. It's good. It's cool. It's the way of the future. Meanwhile, they're going to completely, 100% pervert the uh, original idea of cryptocurrency and what it was meant to do, which was to undermine the central banks themselves, to present of uh, an international method of exchange that does not require or even allow central banks to operate. They're going to take that, uh, make private blockchains that, that are nationally administered, 
and probably administered by central banks themselves, and present that to the public as, this is digital cryptocurrency, guys. You can take these wallets that the government will I- issue you, and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll use this in the future. This is where things are going. And the, the real danger about that is, of course, is that the blockchain uh, is not anonymous, all transactions are monitored in there, and everything that happens on there is kept forever. Um, the the difference being on a uh, on an open public blockchain, you can at least have pseudonymity. I mean, an uh, an account number is not a person. In, in, inter, it's an in right. internet, as opposed to intranet, that's what China's I, doing. Essentially, now. Their yeah, is they want to create national intranets um, where they administer everything. I know. You know, so many millions upon millions of people have become you know, privy to, you know, understanding the central banking system and, and the slavery that, that ensues because of it, I think it's going to be tough for them to completely control this uh, because, I mean, really, as you said, there is some sense of anonymity. We're going to be able to, to, to work around it to a certain extent. I think there's you know going to be some cowboys out there, right? Oh, there always are. There are always cracks in any system, and partly that is intentional because we know that, I mean, at the very least, the deep state needs their backdoors in the financial system so they can launder money and uh, drug money and all of that. They need those backdoors. So they will exist, and a dedicated, informed public that really wants to get out there and do it. There will always be space for pirates of various sorts. Mm But it will be, like in any other age, that will be almost a leper class. You know, oh, you know, you don't want to do that. You want to play ball with the system and KYC and, and sign all the, all the right paperwork and make sure that you're not going to get in trouble with the man. And 99% of the population, if not more, will go along because it's the easiest way to get along. Yeah, and I, th- I think that, you know, ultimately for me, I've, I've already said to myself that, you know, if we fall under full-blown, you know, these, these type of controls... Look, I'm going to be a pirate 100%. I will be, uh, I'm, I'll be, I'll have shipping containers full of AK-47s and ammo coming in and and selling them with you know with digital currency and everything else. I mean, I I already foresee myself just not conforming to that, not at all. And let I'm me, sure there's let me millions, make a suggestion for you. of other people doing the same. Let me make a suggestion: PiratesWithoutBorders.com. I you like can become that. a pirate today if you want. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so, yeah, I mean, it's it's scary, man. It truly is. I mean, I was just having a conversation with a friend today. Like you said, using all the fuzzy words of, you know, it's just, you know, you got to love the earth. And you know what I mean? Like you said, it doesn't have to be a binary thing. Of course, you can love the environment without signing on just specifically to co2 because there's so many other conversations from water vapor to the process of the sun i mean we just don't give this much which is weird not weird but it's like when you say co2 it just goes to the heart of how things grow co2 is a part of photosynthesis we expel co2 which obviously is part of photosynthesis so it's like humans are the problem yeah interesting i mean there's so many levels to this psyop but one of them is that it's not co2 no one says co2 too they all say carbon carbon which is not only scientifically inaccurate, but but it does get to the point that we are carbon-based life forms. And it does, I think, drive home the point that ultimately this is about demonizing humanity. We do not have to conjecture about that. That is yeah. in black and white Which in their own words. Which goes back to their original eugenics agenda, well, quite frankly. Well, read the Club of Rome's The First Global Revolution from 1991, where they literally say that carbon, uh, that the threat of global warming would fit the bill that they are looking for to make humanity the enemy of man. It's a crazy statement out there in black and white in 1991 from the Club of Rome. You can go look up. I bring it up uh, often because I still don't think you know one person in a million has heard of it, but it's right there in black and white. They say they want to make humanity the enemy of man and they will use the threat of global warming to do so. What what craziness? What kind of mentality is that, well, it's the mentality, unfortunately, of people with inordinate amounts of wealth and resources to bear to bring to bear on the topic. 
Well, I even saw what was it? Uh, Acacio Cortez was hanging out in her apartment drinking wine or whatever, just t- taking questions from people. And she was like, "Yeah, we probably should not be having as many kids." And I've even seen other just people on the news like, "Yeah, we should." That would go a long way to stemming the you know carbon pro- carbon dioxide carbon problem. We would just stop having as many kids, et cetera, et cetera. Which again, you know, code word. You bring out your Captain Crunch decoder ring. It's like humans are the problem. Yeah, it's exactly. And of course, everyone. I always get pushback from people about that when I pr- point this out. I. I I call it carbon eugenics, and if you type carbon eugenics into my search bar, you can find all sorts of things I've done on this, where I've been talking for a decade plus now about sterilization programs, and, and, oh, you don't want children. Children will be bad for the environment. They've been pushing this for a while. Now it's now they're still trying to push it. I don't think it is organically taking off, but they're pushing these groups, uh, the birth strike movement and other things, that they're always trying to push this in people's faces. But again, Look. this is kind of like China. China's so ahead of the curve with their 5G and their technocracy right now, their their blockchain, etc. But there was they had their population, you know, only one kid or whatever it was they for so long. They had the one-child policy. They got rid yeah. of it, interestingly. They never yeah, even, but, it wasn't even exactly a one-child policy. For the rural areas, there was there was more children allowed and things like that. So it was never, but they did they did have it. And now now they want to develop their economy. Now they're having more children. Hmm, I wonder how that works. That actually, again, this is a whole other branch of uh, incredibly important fake science that's been pushed on people. The overpopulation bunk that has been push, pushed on us for uh, the better part of 60, 70 years now. I... I hope people would go back and watch the, my uh, Corp Report podcast on Paul Ehrlich. Meet Paul Ehrlich, uh, uh, pseudo scientist, charlatan. That's Obama's guy. <laughs> I can't remember. Obama, Obama's I can't remember the science title. guy. But yeah, Paul yeah, Ehrlich, who wrote the population bomb and was really got this going in the public consciousness. Uh, not only is he wrong about everything, he's predicted so many things. By the year two thousand, the UK will be. Uh, uh, will, will be over because uh, the, f- the the food riots and everything and blah blah blah. It's the same old Malthusian nonsense that we've been hearing for the past 200 plus years since Thomas Malthus started uh, mouthing it, but it continues to be promoted and people like Paul Ehrlich continue to be showered with accolades for their failed predictions, their history of nothing but failed predictions. That's, that's Al Gore 101, because like right now we should be all underwater and polar exactly, bears would all yeah. be dead, ice caps should all be melted, which is funny oh, yeah. coming from a guy who had hundreds of thousands of share from his father in Occidental Petroleum Corporation. You know, another person who's, you know, just neck deep in oil telling us how to preserve and conserve and climate or carbon credits. That's so funny. His company or with his guy, the blood guy. So it's blood and gore or gore and blood or something. That's yeah. literally the guy's name. Al Gore and this last guy, the guy's yeah. last name. Here's a blood. conspiracy but theory for you. Time. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Well, here's a conspiracy theory for you. So it's been making the rounds again. It was talked about a couple decades ago, but there was apparently press reports at the time. I can't remember which airport, but there was some airport where Al Gore's suitcase got knocked over or something and blood poured out of it. And... It was apparently, I haven't seen the reports, I, I haven't seen them, so I don't know, but apparently this was reported, even AP or Reuters or whatever it was at the time, but Al Gore is carrying around bags of blood when he goes traveling, what's this all about? And so the theory is it has something to do with, uh, the, as we now know, millionaires, billionaires have been paying for the blood of young children to be in, uh, transfused uh, into them. Uh, what's it called? Adrenochrome and all of that, right? Yeah. And that's an actual science. And mm. that, you know, oh, no, but, absolutely. It is. No, but uh, but So real. Al Gore apparently got caught out with that a couple of decades ago. So here's the big conspiracy theory. All blood and gore, like literally having a, a, a co-worker or a co-investor yeah. named blood, completely uh, messes up the search for that particular thing. When you try to search about gore and the bags of blood, you're just going to get blood and gore kind of stuff from his company. <laughs> no, but the, the point that I wanted to get to is that, you know, with all of this stuff that, you know, I've had conversations with, and look, I've been in the TV industry for many years now. You know, I, I started out as a professional athlete and a coach and have been involved in the television industry. And of course, the television television industry has a lot of folks who, you know, lean liberal and it's, it's, you know, the, the hatred of, of not only Donald Trump, but, but, you know, the big, the big corporations, you know, polluting, they don't use polluting. But when I say, listen, can we just have a common sense conversation and understand that the other side, meaning me as a conservative, doesn't want to see pollution all all the way down to from the from the multinational corporations dumping stuff in our rivers, all the way down to somebody throwing a, a wrapper out of the window of their car. 
I don't want to see it at all. Neither do you. Let's talk about pollution. Let's let's stop with this human caused global warming because now, you know, and I had this conversation just just this week with a lot of people that I work with. They're great people. They're concerned with the environment, but they have been they have been um, hook, line, and sinker that it's human caused. And I said, look, man, um, you know, NASA and a lot of other scientists are saying, you know. We're, they're warning of warning us that we're in the middle of a solar mi- uh, minimum and that we're headed into a mini ice age. Okay, so let's can we please stop with with the human causes? Maybe we bumped it a little bit, but ultimately, look, the sun is in control of of our of our atmosphere of our world. That's the way it is. I mean, can we just stop? Well, that my, my, my my diesel my diesel truck. Uh, or my my, my 150 uh, V6 is is not going to turn the world into an inferno. It 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 is not. But again, that go. I mean, you're you're absolutely right. But that's you're just speaking straight common sense. What what what's going on? And as we know, this is one of those things. Kind of going back to your our World War One conversation and the Milner Group. They planted that seed, and it took 15, 20, or however long for the World War for World War One to happen. These are one of those generational things that they planted the seed on in the early nineteen hundreds. And again, had to change the framework of eugenics to climate change and stuff. But it's like they're they're never going to let that go, Pat. I, I'm, I, I'm with but you, but it's like this is at the beginning this is the next of evolution they're going for. Do. At the beginning of every show that we do, we need to ask people this. We need to say, I don't care if you are a full-blown socialist, a communist, a free market um, believer. I, I don't care what your background is. Do you want the truth? And if you're and if you're presented with the truth, will you at least believe it? Or will you just ignore it and keep believing what the talking heads in the media will tell you? Can, can I back that up? Because this is the thing that frustrates me the most out of these topics that we're talking about right now. I know um, I get you wound up. Which are, <laughs> uh, I mean, these are the most important topics facing the world in the, uh, at the current time and in the foreseeable future. These are going to literally transform the way we live our lives, the economy, everything we can Absolutely. think about. Absolutely. And... I consistently get feedback from people. Um, I mean, obviously, I get a lot of pushback. Oh, are you? You're a global warming denier, and blah blah blah. Okay, whatever. I mean, I, I get where they're coming from, and uh, you know, they we're not. Which is again, that's part of the language. You're a global global warming denier, which means you might be a Holocaust denier too. Uh, that denier, yeah, that exactly denier. You know, you know just use the yes. word. But here's the here's the thing that really gets to me is when people. After I've laid out the case, and I've done so many videos talking about how, what is the average global temperature? How is that derived? You know, where does this come from? What, what data sets are being used? How are those data sets manipulated? I've gone into this in so much detail. Eventually, sometimes I'll get this feedback from people. Well, James, even if it is just a big hoax, it's a good one because it's getting people off of big oil, right? No! First of all, what do you think it is that I do? I do not just, oh, that's a lie, but it's a good lie, so we better just go along with that lie. No, I don't do that. I, I, that is against everything that I believe and all of my core principles. And secondarily, if you don't understand the lie and the purpose, the reason why they are constructing this lie, you are going to be led directly into the wrong, fake, phony solution that they're pushing you, yes. they're pushing yes. society into. That's the point of this. And people who want a convenient lie, uh, that that really annoys me. But that, again, that's part of the program that it. takes generations and years and years. You have these like these millennials now who, God bless their soul, they're, they're you know they're of that kind of. No, we we just want to genuinely save the earth, not knowing the inside baseball. Going back to what we're talking about, eugenics. They some of them might know, but they can't possibly and still support this and be hey, like, Rick, yeah, we're breaking free from from big oil. Like, no, sorry. dude. Ricky tried jumping in a couple times. Ricky, uh, what what did you have to say? I, I kind of forgot, but well, well, <laughs> but one thing I did want to get into a, a little bit, which is to bring up before we run out of time, is, I mean, so there, there's obviously, I think one huge thing, and James hits on a lot, I think it's very important, is that this idea that the science is settled. And you hear that with vaccines, you hear that with uh, climate, uh, they use climate denier the same way they use conspiracy theorists. It's like, they're, right. they're just, you know, basically, if you're a climate denier, you might also be talking, you know, the next conversation might be about the 9-11 or might they just, yeah, the Holocaust, they'll they'll pigeonhole you in that. 
purpose. And I, and I think it's a that. huge issue. But one thing, you know, I also have a, a, a little bit of, or at least I'm uncertain about if, you know, like this thing, I think the science is unsettled in both directions. I think we're not 100% sure the effect we have on the earth. And we're not 100% sure we have any effect. And I think almost anybody who's too confident, I mean, if you look at both sides of the arguments, and, and since we've decided to have this uh, this podcast, I've listened to a lot of climate debates. You know, somebody's pro, you know, climate change or uh, uh, and the other one's a denier or thinks it's a hoax or whatever. And if you look at the, all the statistics and all the science that they're referring to, none of it is really good. And none of it is really <laughs> You know, some of it, I mean, like you said, like James has said, some of the predictions have been so unbelievable. I, I remember hearing David Wallace on like a Jerogan podcast talking about in like, you know, just in, I forget how many years that like, we're going to 50% of, of California is going to be on, you know, on fire, you know, and all this stuff is going to happen and all, you know, and it's like, you know, I think that you guys are definitely, you know, inflaming that. But you, I also understand that cars, for example, like if I turn my car on and I, keep it running in the garage, I'm going to die if I'm in the car, if I'm in that garage. So that has to, you know, that obviously isn't good for the environment. I also understand the corporations, you know, putting stuff into the water to save money. I mean, if you look at the history of fluoride, for example, you know, it was a, a great way of uh, saving some money. Let's convince people it's good for you. And, um, and, and that's not good either. And I don't, and the problem is that it, it's become such a political issue where similar to like, if you're anti-war, you, you must be, uh, you know, not patriotic. You might, you must be anti-truth. Exactly. You must, not, you must not. It's like same thing where like, if you have any actual open discussion about this and you question any of the science or any, any of this stuff, all of a sudden you're anti-environment. You know, and let's be honest, we're not, that there is an argument made that if you eliminated humans from the earth, it would be better off, you know, but uh, but I also think that they're justify, you know, they're demonizing uh, this stuff for for the purpose of you know financial gain and, and social control and, and you know like everything we've been talking about, like you know it, it's not a good lie because they're, all they're doing is they found a way of controlling you at at one point it was with big oil and then they're finding a new way of controlling you. They're just like okay, things are transitioning for we sure. Can't, we can't ride this horse forever. We know <laughs> this is going to end eventually. So they're just, they're basically like really good business men who are like, hey, we see the market changing. We have to go with the market. So it's like, we know we can't milk this cow forever. That oil can't be the way we control uh, people forever. So now they're finding other ways. And this is, and this is the thing is, so regardless what you believe about the science, you know, or if uh, humans are having an uh, impact on the earth and, and the climate or whatnot, I mean, you, you guys have all talked to uh Randall Carlson, who is really knowledgeable in, in the history of the earth warming and cooling and stuff like that. I mean, right. it's quite, you know, you talk to people like him, they understand this is, that does happen. And be, before humans had factories and cars like that, that did happen. We, we know pretty well. Well, that, and there's, you know, there's the geo geo engineering side of it too. It's like, you know, when you, it's springtime and we've just been ripped here in the Midwest with floods and tornadoes. It's spring, it's summer. That's kind of what happens. But if you go back, it's not really that much more frequent. But to just gauge it just on its own, just the natural weather, we really can't do that right now because of what we now know they're doing to the weather. They're geoengineering think, things to possibly create that's, storms. That's that's the major point right there is what I've been thinking the whole time this entire spring is that I have hardly seen the sun this entire spring. I feel like I'm in Seattle, but with thunderstorms and tornadoes. And I can tell you, look, there have been many springs where we've had tons of storms, tons of water. This one's a little unprecedented. But I do recently recall that Bill Gates and several others talking about that they're going to be seeding, they're going to be spraying, they're going to be blocking the sun's rays. Um, you know, a lot of that stuff was, was going to be picking up steam. And it seems to me that, look, does it coincide? Is it mere coincidence? Potentially. But I can tell you that that uh, I haven't seen a sun a whole the sun a look, whole lot in I, Iowa and and look if they want to claim uh, they've already admitted that they're doing it even more now that they were picking it up as I said it's working I haven't seen the sun it hasn't been warm here in Iowa global warming isn't look, check, happening check my Facebook page my home page will probably be gone by most people listen when most people listen to this I was raised in Davenport Iowa not far where Pat is now. I was raised probably, how far am I from the river, Pat? Maybe 10, 15 miles. 
Someone no, posted not even a, that, right? Not even that. Someone posted a video today who now live across the street from where I grew up. There was literally, I'd say, a foot of water rolling down Colony Drive. I lived there my whole life, 19, 20 years. Never even – there was a field that got flooded every once in a while. It was an, it was. Hey guys, river, I'm sorry, I really, I've river. literally got to get going out the door here. Um, so yeah. let me just end with three things and then you guys can wrap up. One, uh, for geoengineering and its relation to climate change, I would suggest people look at a video I did a few years ago, geoengineering, the real climate change threat. Secondarily, parenthetically, I'll just say, um, Ricky, uh, your closed uh, garage door analogy suggests an equivalency between carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. Yeah. And that, of course, is, I think, part of the con the engineered confusion around these issues. But uh, thirdly, yes, uncertainty. There is uncertainty, absolutely. But just saying there is uncertainty gets you labeled a denier at this <laughs> point and locks off the conversation. One of the fundamental figures in all of climate science is called equilibrium climate sensitivity, which is a lot of jargony nonsense for essentially, if you double the amount of carbon dioxide that is in the atmosphere right now, how many degrees Fahrenheit for my American friends, Celsius for the rest of the world, how many degrees uh, Celsius will the, the, the global temperature rise? That is, that is the heart, the heart of this uh, agenda that they're trying to push on us. And not only is there great uncertainty in that figure, but that, uh, that figure has been drifting downward and downward and downward in each IPCC report. Every time they come out with a report, it's a little bit lower. Oh, you know, we thought the doubling of CO2 would, would be this much warming. Actually, it's a lot less warming. And they keep dialing that downward, but it continues to have this big range. Well, it can go from, you know, one, one degree to 4.5 or whatever it is. So let's, let's assume it's 4.5 or whatever it is. Again, this is the trick that they are pulling as if carbon dioxide is the thermostat for the earth and they can dial it right. up or dial it down with precision accuracy, <laughs> total lunacy all with a price tag my friend all, all with, with a price, price tag. tag it's all about the money it's all about the benjamins that's what it keeps coming down to i gotta go but and thank control. you guys for and control. thank you man james the corbett the corbett report.com and that was awesome thank you peace james thank you so Take much care. James, James again. available now from corbettreport.com oil the 19th century was transformed by it the 20th century was shaped by it, and the 21st century is moving beyond it. But who gave birth to the oil industry? And what are they planning to do with that power in a post-carbon world? Heirs to an oil fortune join the divestment drive. There is a price to carbon in their future. The negative impact of population growth. That is important not only for the planet, it is important for the business. What do you see as the biggest challenges in, in conservation? Yeah, the, the growing human population. How and why Big Oil conquered the world. Watch the documentary for free or purchase a DVD copy at corbettreport.com slash bigoil.